Uh, all right, uh, hello everyone. Welcome to my channel, Tremendous Views. I am starting out my content here with uh, throwing out a little challenge uh, to my brother, Brother Eric from the Plastic Soundwave Cult. There we go. And uh, I've appeared on his channel and um, I had an idea for a game kind of based on uh, Herman Hesse's glass bead game uh, using our music collections. And so the idea is uh, one of us will pick an album, uh, me starting the game since it's my game and I'm gonna kind of lay down the rules and we'll have five minutes to uh, talk about the album a little bit and then I will throw it over to uh, my brother who'll have a day or two to think on it and he's going to come up with a connection to an album that is in his collection. Uh, and he will talk about that for five minutes and he'll throw it back to me and after we have a, a handful of them we will uh, or I will combine them into a single video and finally have a video for the watching on the subject of music on my channel. So this is uh, the opening shot of the glass bead game trying to figure out what to call it maybe the collection connection. Um, I'm sure I'll come up with a name for it by the time I, I uh, title the video. And so my first choice. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. And uh, what, would you like to say anything before I start? Yeah. Music collection connection. Music collection. There you go. There you go. Collection collection. I'll, I'll screw that up constantly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So here's my opening shot. So. He's, he's here just to hear me talk about it. Uh, this is going to be pretty much all me talking on the first time. And then uh, when he comes back with his choice, it'll be me uh, listening to him talking. And uh, it'll be a wide array of outfits and fashion and uh, all in good fun. And so here we go. My first move in the game is... An album from 1981 the fourth album from Joe Jackson. Joe Jackson's Jump and Jive. Now this is an alternate cover. This is, uh, it was released in 1981 on A&M Records. And uh, I'm sure I'll put the actual original cover up, which I think I prefer the original cover. It's a pet peeve of mine when they change the album art uh, on a reissue, but this was a 1998 remaster and uh, I had the original version. I tried to dig it up. I'm not sure where it is. It exists, I believe, still in my house somewhere. Um, but I was not able to find it. And so this is a kind of a bare bones reissue, but it is his fourth album. Interestingly, it was after three albums of kind of uh, straight ahead, angst ridden, new wave uh, pop. You know, he's kind of, in a lot of ways, considered one of the big three, uh, along with Elvis Costello and uh, Parker, Graham Parker. There we go. So after three albums uh, of the, the New Wave Pop, uh, it took a big left turn after his original band dissolved. And his, uh, the only person left from the original band was the bassist, Graham Maybe. And so he plays and he put together a... Uh, seven piece combo, I believe, and decided to record a bunch of covers of uh, some jump blues classics and jive and swing uh, tunes from the likes of uh, Louis Jordan, uh, predominantly Lester Young, and Cab Calloway, and uh, Glenn Miller, Tuxedo Junction as a song not written by Glenn Miller, but uh, popularized by Glenn Miller, these songs from the 40s that people in retrospect, I mean, weirdly saw as a sort of a precursor to the, to the swing revival that happened in the mid 90s. But I mean, this was 15 years earlier. So uh, it was really just a fish out of water uh, 
at the time. It was his first big career left turn in a career that's made a lot of left turns. Uh, Joe Jackson, he's done symphonic albums. He's done a tribute album to Duke Ellington. Um, yeah, so he put together jazz combos, horns, clarinets, um, drummer, uh, Larry Tolfrey, I believe I can look up his name right here. And yeah, did a bunch of uh, jump and swing. Yeah, Larry Tolfrey on the drums. We have uh, Pete Thomas, not that Pete Thomas, uh, not the drummer from <laughs> uh, Elvis Costello on the attractions, but a, a horn player, a sax player named Pete Thomas, Raul Oliveira, Nick Weldon, and Dave Batelli. Uh, make up the rest of that combo and it uh, did moderately well on the charts um, really it's it's Joe Jackson is interesting to me in that he only ever really had one indisputably be in, indisputably big album in night and day which was the album his fifth album the album after this that was a top 10 hit in a lot of countries um, this had two singles released from it, the title track and uh, Jack You Dead. And they, it, it was a minor hit and I didn't quite scrape into the top 40 in England and was not a hit here uh, in the US. And for a guy who's sort in a lot of ways considered among the giants of early new wave, he did not score hits not a ton outside of the uh, stepping out and then a few other minor hits but this was just kind of a one-off jump and jive uh, 1981 and uh, I will let you uh, look up whatever details you choose to uh, about the album see if you can make a connection to something in your collection all right so day two you've had a day to think about it what'd you come back with um well the artist that you showed yesterday was joe jackson jump and jive and uh that came out in 1981 mm -hmm. so I have a tie there. This album did not come out in 1981, but this artist's first album came out in 1981. Uh, I actually found three ties to tie it all together. And so that there was that, that this was, you know, that 1981 connection. Um, but this artist went on to also do a big band type of sound. Um, well, he had a big band, and, and Joe Jackson is more, well, it's like a five piece, it's more Except. jazz, big band. So, there's that connection too that this guy ended up going into that area as well. Um, but the main thing that got me was is the name of that album, Jump and Jive. And I'm like, I think I got that song. But I didn't have it. I added a little bit to it. It's Jump, Jive, and Whale. Mm, I think I saw that coming. And so uh, this is a 19, 1997 album from Brian Setzer uh, and his orchestra. Uh, mm -hmm. The Boogie. Probably should hold it this way. Um, you know what? What kind of nails in? Um, I actually got this because I went and saw him live. I went to go see Madness, and it was Madness, Brian Setzer Orchestra, Royal Crown Review, and uh, Dance Hall Crashers. Ended up picking this up. This album is so good. Uh, it's the same thing. It's got some covers on it. Um, but it starts off with a banger. Uh, this cat's on a hot tin roof. Um, the famous song from on here, Jump, Jive, and Whale. Um, that was the first connection I made with it. So 
that's the main connection for me. But I did manage to tie in a couple other things with the albums as well. He does a cover of, you know, Brian Setzer was in Stray Cats. Um, their first hit was Rock This Town, I believe. And so uh, he does a version of Rock This Town, which is absolutely incredible. Um, the guitar solo on it, he's a really, really good guitar player. Um, you have Gwen Stefani is on this album. Uh, and she just makes it sound very authentic. She has a voice that sounds like it could come from that time, but like if you heard them live, you know what I'm saying? When you hear records from there now, the sound quality wasn't as good, but when you hear it with modern production style, oh yeah, she sounds like she could come right from the 1940s. And just uh, a big boombastic sound with a little bit of rock, you know, mixed in with it. I think this is why I've always felt that this kind of does big band fall under jazz yeah i think it's a subheading yeah so this this is my favorite kind of jazz i'm not a big jazzy guy but i do really like big band and swing you know if you want to get into like some some high octane jazz this is it right here i love it man i think it's awesome it's hot baby hot baby it's hot uh, you got, uh, let's see, 15 seconds left, actually. Anything wow. else? Just that uh, it feels like deja vu, but. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, just get this album and get the Stray Cats, too. Stray Cats are pretty good as well. All right. Yeah, Stray Cats. Um, all right. So that is Ball in My Court. And uh, there you go. And uh, I will uh, marinate on it and uh, come up with something, and uh, we will hit the next play tomorrow. Okay. All right. All right. Uh, day three. Uh, it's my turn and uh, my connection. Uh, to uh, Dirty Boogie from Brian Setzer Orchestra is uh, I thought about how it contained Rock This Town, which was a Stray Cat song, and he redid it with horns uh, for the uh, Brian Setzer Orchestra remake. So I thought about uh, another uh, situation that was uh, exactly like that. So I came up with Bill Collins, face value, which uh, bonus points uh, connects to my first one in that the reissue, he redid the cover. <laughs> and I do have the original as well. Uh, so I bought that a couple of times. But uh, yes, um, the Genesis album, uh, for which Phil Collins drummed and sang, uh, opened the album Duke with a song called Behind the Lines. Uh, which he uh, re-recorded with horns uh, in a different style, in a, in a light funk style uh, for bass value. And I wanted to say I practiced this uh, one day. I won't choose an album from 1981, but it is not this day. <laughs> so, so there we go. So it's from 1981 as well. Uh, just as a coincidence. Um, huge album, obviously, has sold more than 15 million copies. Uh, and even though it's only his third best-selling record after uh, No Jacket Required, which was huge, and but seriously, I, I feel like it's his enduring album. It's sort of the one that sneaks past even the critics of, oh my God, Phil Collins, uh, you know, this ubiquitous, uh, pop pap machine from the 80s who was constantly hogging up the charts for himself. Uh, I think even the people who think that have a soft spot for face value. And it's very unconventional uh, 
premiere single uh, in the air tonight. A uh, very different sort of song for the time uh, in atmosphere, just a long, slow atmospheric song that is uh, kind of a downer uh, that as a, a recent uh, YouTube reaction video made go viral, the fact that the drums don't actually come in until like the three and a half minute mark or something like that. Uh, but this is a, an album I've, I first owned it on cassette. I bought it now three times. So I bought, the, I bought it on CD and I had a lot of Phil Collins uh, on cassette uh, when I was, when they were current albums. Uh, but this is the only one that I bought on disc and now I bought it twice. I bought it and it's remaster. But it's a great kind of low key. I feel like uh, this, well, this album was written in the wake of his divorce. Um, so that that's what he was really thinking about. And that's kind of uh, an overriding theme. Uh, just this kind of sense of loss and loneliness because it was, uh, he was not the one doing the divorcing. He was the one getting divorced <laughs> from, uh, and he didn't want to be divorced. Uh, so it's kind of a downer and it, it really feels like for launching a solo career, like it's almost an accidental hit record uh, because it really didn't conform to a, a lot. Well, I missed again, the other uh, single. It, it, it had four or five singles uh, around the world in different territories. If Leaving Me Was Easy, Thunder and Lightning, and uh, oh, This Must Be Love. Uh, but I think the two primary singles were uh, I Missed Again, which is much more upbeat but it's an upbeat song about not finding love <laughs> um, and in the air tonight. So I love, I spent a lot of time with, this was a, a cassette I had when I had maybe three cassettes at my disposal. I had this and like Toto and um, I can't even think what else, but uh, I listened to so many times. The Roof is Leaking is a song that just felt so emotionally deep. When I was 10 years old, it just felt like the most desolate and it was something I would play over and over again when I was feeling down and it just felt like everything was terrible. But I love it, you know, I, I think I got embarrassed about it like a lot of people did, you know, post 90s kind of after a groovy kind of love and everybody just sort of collectively decided to get sick of Phil Collins, and I kind of downplayed it for a while. He was one of the people kind of like Queen that I dissociated with for a while. But by the time I stopped caring about that kind of thing, I'm like, ah, the songs are just too good though. So um, I'm going back to it. And uh, so, yeah, I, that's my, uh, my response to you. And I will put the ball back in your court. I don't really have enough room to. <laughs> Fantastic pantomiming there. You're a terrible thrower. <laughs> All right, day four. What do you got for me? All right, well. You did Phil Collins. Mm -hmm. You stuck with 1981. You even connected to yourself. <laughs> so um, as I was uh, listening to that yesterday, I realized that uh, there is another drummer out there named Phil. And so I checked to make sure, and it was. And that drummer plays in a band that released an excellent album in 1979. So I went a little bit older. I think I got the oldest one so far. Mm -hmm. um, and that drummer is Phil, Filthy Animal Taylor from Motorhead. This is their second album. 
some argue between this one and Ace of Spades as being their best album. Um, I like this one a lot. It's got my favorite Motorhead song on it called uh, Limb from Limb. And so there's Filthy Animal right there. And uh, is it self titled? The, uh, I, I don't know if you'll be like testing out the waters on this one. <laughs> I might try. Is it self titled? No, it's Overkill. So, this is their second album, Overkill. So, the first one is black with this guy's face on it still together. So, they kind of intertwined this, this mascot. So I don't know if I'm allowed to show more albums, but I've got four of their albums, and this is their first four. I have the first four Motorhead albums. First one was kind of a punk, still heavy, but it definitely punk influenced. And then uh, this one came out, and it's just solid rock and roll. It's just hard and fast rock and roll, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, and those guys lived it too. So uh, obviously, uh, not one of the guys on this record is is still alive. So uh, actually, the drummer uh, Phil Taylor passed away first. Then Lemmy, and not long after Lemmy, uh, Fast Eddie ended up uh, passing away. So they all passed away kind of in a brief amount of time. I think though there was a couple of years between Phil and Lemmy. I remember Lemmy just before uh, David Bowie passed away. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, dude, this has got some of their best songs on here. Overkill, the title track is really good. Um, I like Stay Clean. Uh, Capricorn is a good one. No class. Damage case is awesome. And then Limb from Limb is my all-time favorite Motorhead song. So, oh my God. All right, you got a minute left. Do you want to show the other four or the other three? <laughs> so, of this, I don't know what you call it. You have a trilogy. What do you call it? A quadrilogy? The some have called it that. I think it's a, I think it's a tetralogy, maybe. But uh. tetralogy. Well, to me, the tetralogy is you got the first album. You got this one that comes out next, which is super popular. Then you you get the forgotten album, which is bomber. And then you come out with the, you come out swinging with the, if I'd have known, I would have pulled these out quicker. That probably <laughs> killed my pretty good, huh? Okay, so that's Ace of Spades. And that's, uh, okay, I think I have uh, a notion of what to do next. All right, so yesterday you had uh, Overkill by Motorhead, and uh, I thought of a couple of directions I could go for the connection, something deep, something hard hitting, but instead I went for the umlaut. <laughs> so if you think I'm picking up a Motley Crue album, you don't know my record collection. <laughs> so I'm going with Bjork. Thelma songs from 2000. So Bjork's got the little umlaut over her, or I guess technically Bjork. It should be Bjork, not Bjork. But people know her as Bjork here, so. And I won't even take a pass at her uh, last name, which I even listened to videos about how to pronounce and I still can't pronounce it. I heard her say it and I still don't know how you pronounce it. <laughs> Uh, so that is uh, Selma's songs was sort of 
slotted in between her fourth and fifth albums. Uh, if you count it as an album, it's her fourth album. Uh, if you don't count it as an album, it's kind of a seven song, um, like long EP, but it is the songs that she wrote for uh, the Lars von Trier film, Dancer in the Dark, in which she starred in 2000. So it's kind of a pseudo soundtrack. In some regions, I think it, it, it acknowledges that. Um, I think I've seen it listed on Discogs as even just called Dancer in the Dark or Selma Songs, music from Dancer in the Dark. But uh, here in the US, it was just called Selma Songs, Selma being the character uh, that she played starring in the, in the film. And so the film is uh, about a, a woman who lives a very dreary existence, uh, but kind of a Walter Mitty existence. She uh, is enraptured by the uh, perceived glamor of Broadway and her mind takes her into her boring life into musical territory, you know, and she will break out into songs uh, in the middle of the factory and then her life just goes downhill. There's a guy who's uh, chasing her and uh, spoiler warnings, I guess, for a dancer in the dark. Um, and I've only seen it once, so I, but I think she kills him after, like in self-defense. Um, or maybe she didn't do anything at all, but uh, she gets accused and convicted for the crime. And uh, even on her way to the gallows, uh, she's counting the steps. One of the songs, which uh, makes much more sense in context of the film is called 107 Steps. And it's just kind of counting and she'll sing some of the numbers and it's counting the steps to the gallows. And, uh, in divorcing herself from the reality of her situation. She turns it into a song. Uh, so it's a very depressing little movie <laughs> and shot on a super low budget and looks like a super low budget movie, but the songs kind of incorporate that, that uh, Bjork um, soundscape, you know, electronics and, but with a much more of a bit of Broadway flair, some orchestration, uh, it's got an overture at the beginning, um, and I was listening to it yesterday, and uh, the song in the musicals, uh, I think, takes place uh, in the movie during a courtroom scene, um, is uh, my favorite on the, the disc, I, I believe. Uh, but in the movie, and I'm not even sure how you, how you pronounce it, uh, the song is titled C-V-A-L-D-A, -A, Cavalda, Vault, I don't know if you pronounce the C, but um, is my favorite in the movie. I think it's delivered a little more dynamically, and it's kind of a stomp situation where she's working in a factory, and the rhythmic sounds of the factory sort of gradually bring to life a song, and then it's a big number and look dancing and, you know, or like uh, 500 Days of Summer, you know, you remember that uh, movie, the dance sequence in the middle of it, uh, when the guy starts singing and then almost like a flash mob, everybody, you know, is suddenly doing choreographed dancing all the, in her mind. Um, so that was my five minutes. Um, I don't know what else I have to say. I like it, I don't, I, I'm, I have spotty uh, Bjork catalog. I've got a couple of Sugar Cubes albums. Uh, I've got this, I've got uh, Post and Vespertine are the, the three albums I have of her nine or ten uh, that she's put out. But uh, so yeah, Bjork, Selma Songs, 2000, and uh, I will shoot it back over to you. All right. Shoot it over. <laughs> Selma songs. That was what 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 it was called, right? From yeah. Bjork. Mm -hmm. So, um, I listened to the album. I looked up some stuff on it, and I realized that 
uh, part of it was recorded in Olympic Studios and the entire album was mixed at Olympic Studios. And that opened it wide open to making a connection. And so I found in my collection an early version or an early group that started off in Olympic Studios. And that's the Jimi Hendrix experience. Yeah. I believe this is 1967. I think it came out in 67. And so uh, this was his first album. Uh, this is the American cover. Uh, the English version has a different cover. Uh, also has a different track listing. Um, on the American version, they wanted some other songs. So they took off three songs and I think added two or three songs. Um, but the track listing for this same album in the UK is different than in, in the States. Um, I mean, a definitive debut album. I mean, this guy, this set the standard for what this guy was going to put out from here on out, even though it was only really three albums. When I was younger, I never really got into Jimi Hendrix, but as I've gotten older, I found more and more that Jimi Hendrix is just, he is a virtuoso with his guitar. Um, I hear people complain that his voice is a little bit on the weak side, but I, I think it matches very well in his bluesy style of his music. Um, and after this, he went on to do Access Bold as Love, and then after that, uh, Electric Ladyland, and then unfortunately he passed away after that last album. I figured this would help me get the oldest entry in, even though this is a 2014, 2015 repress. It was one of the first records I got when I started collecting records again. So this is a reissue from Quality Pressings. Uh, so it's it sounds just absolutely wonderful. You can't go wrong with this. And I'm sure you don't have it, so you're going to have to probably look it up on YouTube. But, uh, yeah, Jimi Hendrix. Yeah, you're right. I do, do not have any Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> you still got plenty of time. You got a minute and a half. A minute and a half? Man, I don't know. Uh, I mean, dude, the best froze in the business Hey man, I mean, those are some backlit froze. That, that's a very common trope. I've seen a lot of albums like that where they backlight them like that. And so uh, I forgot what it was. Somebody showed an album the other day, and it was, it was like you could when you saw the white bit, you could see how far this guy's hair actually went out. But it was it was thinner at the ends than it was at the core. So. <laughs> so yeah, Gates it's on reprise, um, and in England it's on. Uh, Any favorite tracks? What's that? Favorite tracks? Oh, favorite tracks on here. Manic Depression is probably one of my favorite. I think that's my favorite. Jimi Hendrix song. It's just hypnotic. Hey Joe is a classic. Foxy Lady. The Wind Cries Mary. That one I love. And uh, yeah, and it starts off with Purple Haze, the, the kicker. So just, just an incredible incredible album. You can't go wrong with it. Alright, sounds good. Well, that's going to wrap up our first week's uh, worth of uh, back and forth. And we will continue on from here. I have to make a selection uh, based off of your selection. Uh, but that will hit a second episode. And uh, yeah, I'll try and keep them compact, half hour 
uh, six albums back and forth. And uh, hopefully we will catch you on the next one if you enjoyed it. And uh, leave a comment, uh, make a connection. Uh, let us know where you would have gone from one album or the other from your collection. And uh, yeah, we will see you on the next round.